Okay, and in this week's podcast episode, the topic is, what is your ownership transition strategy? I'm thrilled to introduce Leah Turnbull, Director of National ESOP Practice Lead with BMO Corporate Advisory. Leah is dedicated to advising boards of directors and C-level executives on ownership transition alternatives, corporate finance topics such as ESOPs, dividend recaps, acquisition strategies, share repurchases, and valuation perspectives. She has over 15 years of experience assisting businesses with new ESOP formations and navigating complex ESOP structuring issues. And just uh, for the audience, ESOP is Employee Stock Ownership Plan, of course, all right? So That's right. just to get that one out of the way. So welcome. Welcome to the show, Leah. This is going to be fantastic. This is Thank you. an absolutely critical topic for entrepreneurs who are thinking of some type of monetary or liquidation event. So if you're good, if I hadn't missed anything from your introduction, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, this is great. And thank you so much for having me. That's awesome, Leah. Okay, so let's get the uh, the thousand foot view, understanding the ownership transition alternatives, right? So if you could, Leah, just to kick it off, let's outline the spectrum of ownership transition strategies available to entrepreneurs, ranging from partial liquidity events like dividend recapitalization, all the way to complete divestitures. Let's talk about the entire spectrum from a thousand foot. Absolutely. So to your point, at one end of the spectrum, there are dividend recaps, which is not going to transition ownership. It's really allowing a business owner to take some chips off the table, diversify their wealth, um, and get some get some money today versus waiting. But overall ownership will stay the same. Then as you take it one step further, where there's a little more change in ownership, you could look at a leveraged share repurchase or some kind of equity recapitalization. And what that entails is either the company is buying shares from you, or maybe it's a partner or a family member, some other party, but internal, if you will, is buying shares. So again, you're able to, to diversify your wealth, take some chips off the table, and gradually step away from the business. Then there's kind of an ESOP, employee stock ownership plan, as you mentioned, where you are creating a trust for the benefit of the employees, in which case you actually sell your shares to the ESOP. So that's a way to kind of also diversify your wealth, but also kind of maintain the company legacy and maintain a benefit plan for your employees. So it can be a very powerful recruiting and retention tool. And then one step further where full transition of ownership would be an outright sale to a third party, whether that's to a private equity firm or to a strategic buyer. It's a way for you to step away. More often than not, those third party buyers want to take control. So it's typically a full sale of all your shares, not always, but more often than that. And then I'll take it one step further, but we're not gonna really focus on this. You could also go public via an IPO. Now that's obviously for larger businesses and, and a much more complicated transaction, but that full range starting from not really transitioning ownership but getting a little bit of, of money day to day to an outright sale is really what you're looking at. And you can go anywhere in between as well. Perfect. Okay. And so Leah, what are the primary considerations uh, that drive the choice between these strategies? So it's a combination of personal goals and objectives and corporate goals and objectives. So on the personal side, what is your timeline? When do you want to sell? Do you want to completely walk away from your business and never think about it again? Or are you more interested in creating that, that ownership transition plan and creating a structure so that the company can continue down the same strategic path? Um, and so what are your estate and tax planning objectives that could impl implicate what the timeline should be? Um, and finally, do you have family involved in the business or do you have family that wants to be involved in the business? Because that would change what potential buyer or what option makes the most sense. Corporate side, it's a matter of what are the long-term objectives? What capital needs do you have? If a business was looking at a major acquisitions or expansion or investment, overall investment in the business, well, those first three topics that I mentioned, the dividend, 
the levered share repurchase and the ESOP are all using debt. They're all leveraged transactions or at a minimum using the company's cash. You're not bringing new capital into the business. And so that means there's only so much money that we all have. That means you have less money for those acquisitions as an example. If you went to an outright buyer, that could be a partner from a capital perspective. So they could bring money to the table. So if the company has major acquisitions, maybe it makes more sense to look at an outside buyer versus looking at an ESOP as an example. Additionally, what are what is their tax status? There's always tax considerations to take into play. Who are the shareholders? What are there's usually differing needs on the shareholders basis, like do all the shareholders want to sell just one um, and how much money are they willing to invest in the business? And then last, but certainly not least, another thing I would mention on the corporate side is who's leadership, who's actually managing the day-to-day -day business. If you have a strong management team that can continue to operate the day-to-day, -day, some of those internal options, dividend, leverage, share, repurchase, ESOP may be a good fit. If you as the business owner are very critical to the business, and if you walk away, the business would probably struggle, yep. then an outside buyer may be the better fit because they can bring in their own management team. They can have some expertise that can help the business continue on an ongoing basis. Perfect. No, that was great. Thank you, Leah. That was a very nice overview. And then further down, and I will talk about some maybe the cultural issues about ownership change and so on, right? Which is critical. Correct. And I've seen that in, in my uh, years of, of doing this as well. But okay, so let's go, uh, you know, 10 feet from uh, from the action here, right? Let's talk about dividend recapitalization and let's hit the fairly high points here. So what are the key advantages, Leo, of dividend recapitalization for owners who are seeking partial liquidity to your point while retaining control of their business? I mean, those are kind of the major benefits, right? You're able to diversify your wealth. I think most privately held business owners, the vast majority of their wealth is tied in their business. They may not have much liquidity outside of the company. So it allows them to diversify their wealth while also still controlling the business, while still keeping the business going the same way as it was before. The considerations though, is that you're using either debt or some of your cash for a shareholder distribution. It's not a productive use of capital. You're not going to get a return on investment in that case. And so you need to make sure that the company can afford to do so and that it doesn't prevent the company from um, investing in the business. Because from a company's perspective, your number one priority should be investing in the business and then paying out shareholders. Got it. It, it, it can be a way to yeah, get you some liquidity while also uh, controlling the business. Absolutely. And so in what scenarios does the dividend recapitalization recapital prove to be the most beneficial strategy, would you say? Usually it's with business owners that are still relatively young, still actively involved in the business, um, and they want to continue to stay involved. Or alternatively, it could be with business owners that aren't as active, but this is more of a, a way for them to, um, they may not be taking big distributions or taking a salary from the company. So this is a way to compensate them as well. But in any case, it's scenarios where the, the goal is not to transition ownership. The goal is just purely to provide liquidity to shareholders. Got it, okay. So let's talk a little bit. Let's go to the other scenario now about a share repurchase, Leah. So same question, uh, you know, 10 feet from the ground here. What are the benefits or, and potential pitfalls? Let's talk about the pitfalls as well associated with a leveraged share purchase, uh, repurchase strategy for owners who are aiming to reduce their stake in the company. Right. So the benefit is that generally the way that leveraged share repurchases would work is when there may be more than one shareholder. So let's say there's three shareholders just to be a, a good example and only one shareholder wants to leave. So that way the company or those other two shareholders can buy those shares back, redeem those shares using the company's balance sheet in a lot of situations to get that one shareholder liquidity, but you don't have to treat all the shareholders the same. They can be diff viewed differently, right? Like if one shareholder wants to sell all of her shares and another one wants to sell half of her shares, 
that's fine. Um, so there's a little bit more flexibility. Benefit is that you can keep the same company legacy, the culture, the business is very much so the same. Considerations and some of the pitfalls is once again, it's a leverage transaction. You're using your capital for a shareholder buyout. So you have to make sure that you can afford to do so. Um, and it's not bringing in a new partner from a, from a capital perspective. It's not going to, if you need a little more help with the business, the leverage share repurchase isn't going to bring in a partner from that perspective. Got it. Okay. So you mentioned um, a couple of times about, you know, these are, these are debt um, scenarios here, right? So how does the, uh, the strategy impact the company's financial structure and future growth potential? And what risk mitigation measures should be considered? Sure. So now you have another party. When you take on debt for shareholder buyout, you either have a, a bank or some other lender out there. And it could even be in a seller note, right? Or in a share, uh, shareholder note. So the seller of the shares doesn't necessarily have to get cash. They could take back a note. Regardless, if it's debt, there is mandatory interest payments. And eventually, whoever your lender is, they're going to want to get repaid and they're going to need that money back. So we all only have so much money, like in both personally and corporation wise. And so you want to make sure that there's a finite amount of capital coming into your business every day and that you have sufficient capital to fund CapEx, to fund um, all your operating expenses, salaries, utilities, et cetera, as well as to fund debt repayment, principal and interest repayment. So it's really a matter of making sure that you can do all the things that you need to do. Um, pitfalls would be if you're over levered. So if you take on so much debt where you end up drowning in principal and interest payments, where all you're doing is paying your debt, which means you don't have any remaining capital to invest in the business that could put you in a really difficult situation. Or if you're in a situation where um, the terms of that debt become overly restrictive. So again, it's a, it's a situation where you're not able to invest in the company and you're, you're limited in overall future growth because of that. So you want to make sure you have a partner that's not overly levering the business, but there is such a thing as a good amount of leverage um, and leverage that'll help you achieve your goals. Right. And and uh, there's a part to that um, the audience should be aware of as well, Leah, you know, reporting covenants, understanding okay. leverage ratios and fixed charge coverage ratios. Just talk a little bit about, you know, the expectation now when you take on this debt, there's compliance and there's reporting and so forth on the back end. Just tell a little bit more about that, please. Sure. So any lender is going to want to make sure that they're mitigating the risk, right? Like, so they're not giving the money just for out of the goodness of their hearts. They're trying to make sure that, A, they get a little return and they get their money back eventually. So some of those covenants are looking at debt to EBITDA. EBITDA is pretty much the most common cash flow um, number that banks look at anyway. And then also cash flow coverage. So that's the ability to, fund all of your obligations. So the things that I mentioned before, CapEx, principal and interest payments, taxes, et cetera. Um, and you wanna make sure that not only do you have enough incoming cash flow to fund those obligations, but you additionally have a little bit of cushion to make sure that if there's a hiccup ever, that you still are not um, in a difficult position. Because the last thing anybody wants on any side of the table is for, the bank or your lender overall to be knocking on your door saying, Hey, you owe us money. That's nobody wants that. So absolutely. And you know, Leah, this is a great point. Thank you. This is in your mind for someone who's going to consider a dividend recap or the leverage, uh, you know, share repurchase, how should the owner think about this? Because, you know, they've given up potential stake of the company or they're taking on additional debt just very, very simply. What are the kind of financial considerations they should be thinking about, you know, their return on equity versus, you know, managing through debt and so forth. Just very simply, let's put it in very simple terms for, um, you know, the people listening. So I think the key message from the debt perspective is making sure that 
even if there is a blip in performance, yeah. that the con the company can continue to perform and to pay all of its obligations. So a lot of times, especially the more cyclical the business, you want to say, okay, I'm at 10 million of EBITDA today. What if I drop 20%? What does that mean? Can I still fund my obligations? And I know a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs are just inherently very positive um, and think everything's going to continue to grow, which hopefully it does. But um, as a banker, I tend to be a little more pessimistic or yeah. I like to say realistic and know yeah. that things don't always work out the way we initially plan. And so you want to have that sensitivity analysis to make sure that you still can pay all your obligations, even if you don't hit plan. Um, and they don't have to be overly burdensome. They should just be realistic. Um, the other thing to note is what does this mean as far as future value? So a lot of times when you're doing a leveraged share purchase or dividend, you're taking money today, which means less money to invest in the company. So it could mean future value may be slightly lower, right? Like, so what does this mean for the value five years from now? Um, and it still may be good, right? Because that money today is more valuable to you than waiting five years to get that money. But that comes back to what are your personal goals and objectives? Where do you think the growth of the company will be? Um, if you think this company is like at the bottom and they're about to skyrocket, I would argue don't sell today. Wait for you to skyrocket. If you feel very, very confident. But if you think, we're at a good steady state. For me personally, it's time for me to diversify my wealth. Now may be the time to sell, but it really is very case specific, both personally and on the business side. Brilliant. Okay, perfect. And and Leah, on that point, because again, in, in my travels, I've seen the importance, particularly in these scenarios, of really understanding your cash flow. And you touched on it just now, right? Understanding the inflows and outflows, understanding some scenario analysis which sometimes isn't, you know, second nature for many entrepreneurs. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the importance of really understanding, you know, the timing of cash inflows and outflows and the type of analysis or reporting that you would expect to really keep your handle on, on cash flow. Right. So I think at a minimum, you should have a very strong idea of what investments are needed in the business. So what well, I should say, First, you should understand what money is coming into the company. So that's revenue, less all your operating expenses to get to really an EBITDA number. Um, what money is expected over the next one to five years, ideally five years, because most debt is a five-year period, but at a minimum over the next 12 to 24 months for sure. Um, and within that, what risks are there? Like how many contracts are up for renewal, like how much money is in hand versus do you have to go out and kind of re-earn that business? Um, so that's really on the inbound incoming funds. And then on the outside, outbound funds, what investments are needed by the business? Do you need to buy new equipment? Do you need to buy new machinery? Do you need to um, invest in a new building, for example? Whatever it is, what investments are needed? What strategic plans do you have? Because those usually require some kind of investment. So it could be an acquisition. It could be expanding into a new geography. How much money is that going to cost you in order to do so? And then what are your existing obligations from a principal, from a debt perspective? And what share, what do shareholders expect? Like to some degree, there's sometimes dividends that the company pays out every year? Is that part of your culture? Is that required? Do you still need to pay out that dividend? Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you have a pretty good feel of all your potential outflows. And then back to my sensitivity point, then seeing, okay, if performance, you know, you know, generally the history of your company and when the business has, has seen a dip, if you saw a similar dip, today with more debt, what levers could you pull to bring back some of those outflows, right? To lessen some of those outflows. So if you're paying a discretionary dividend to shareholders, that's an easy thing to turn off, right? Like odds are you're gonna say, okay, no more dividends. Um, if you, but 
your debt lenders, they probably want to get paid. Investment in the business, most of that is, ma a lot of it's probably maintenance. You've got to do that in order to keep your customers, your employees happy. So you have to figure out what levers you can pull and make sure that even in a downside, you can still maintain, so. Absolutely. No, well done. Thank you, Leanne, for another day, you know, just the day-to-day 13-week -day cash flow, just understanding yes. it now as you bring it down to, to, um, to the reality of short-term planning. But okay, let's keep going on a continuum, ESOP. All right, so yes. what are the primary advantages of implementing an ESOP as a means of providing liquidity for owners? So primary advantages is that it offers a lot of flexibility. So the ESOP itself is the shareholder. That is the buyer of the shares. And you can sell 1% to an ESOP. You can sell 100% to an ESOP and anything in between. So a lot of flexibility. So depending on the personal objectives of the shareholder, they can probably find a solution within the ESOP context. Um, it allows you to maintain your same strategic plan, same management team in place, exactly like the leverage share purchase or a dividend, um, and there's significant tax savings. So it, an ESOP is a qualified retirement plan, just like a 401k plan, but it's designed to be invested in company stock. So to the extent that the ESOP is 100%, is the 100% shareholder, the company will pay zero in federal income taxes. So a lot of businesses, when you start looking at the numbers, they quickly go to the 100% S-Corp ESOP because there's no more federal income taxes. And to the extent that the ESOP does not own 100% of the company, any contributions to the ESOP as a retirement plan are tax deductible. So there's still opportunities for pretty significant tax savings. And then on the personal side, there's the ability to defer and potentially eliminate the capital gains tax on your sale if you sell to an ESOP. So that could be its own podcast, and I won't get into any of the any more details there, but um, significant tax savings is a key message. And then it's also a plan for your employees. So it's a way to provide for your employees, provide for your community. And unlike a 401k plan, the employees do not put any of their own money into the ESOP. It is free money as far as they can; they are concerned. So it's definitely a way to keep that culture and keep that legacy of your business. And it's a great recruiting and ret retention tool. So those are some of the high level benefits. I think there's definitely some considerations. It's not a... Um, it's not as cheap of a transaction as the leverage sherry purchase. So my rule of thumb is that a company should have at least 2 million of EBITDA before they even consider the ESOP just because there's a lot of costs tied to it. Um, and it is a, it's a regulated trust. It falls under the purview of the Department of Labor as a retirement plan. And as such, you need to make sure that you have the right advisors in place, which takes time and it takes money. So you just have to be aware of that. And once again, it's a leverage transaction. So same things that we've been talking to, about so far is that you want to make sure you have enough capital to not only just fund the ESOP, but also to continue to grow and invest in your business. And what have you seen, Lee, in terms of the percentage of the business that goes into an ESOP? Just, just tell a little bit about, you know, where that typically kind of converges. Vast majority of time, it's 100% ESOP because once business owners start looking at the tax savings, it just makes sense. So a yeah. lot of business owners think they're going to initially just do a 30% ESOP, just throwing out a number. So it allows them to continue to control the business. But once you start running the analysis, it makes sense for them to go ahead and sell the entire company. And they still have a vested interest in the business because they're taking back a seller note for a pretty good chunk of that sale to an ESOP more often than not. So they still have some potential, not only upside, but also just, uh, a, they're still continue to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations in a lot of ways um, with the ESOP. Got it. Okay. And how does a ESOP in your experience, the uh, typically impact company culture, employee retention and overall business performance? So, Overall, in general, yes. there's plenty of studies that have shown that turnover is much lower by selling to an ESOP. 
profitability and efficiency of ESOP-owned companies is much higher than non-ESOP companies, especially during COVID when a lot of businesses had to lay employees off. There was a study that showed that ESOP companies laid off a minute amount of employees relative to non-ESOP companies. So there's definitely a lot of um, recruiting and retention benefits and just the overall culture is, is much stronger generally for ESOP because employees really start to feel like owners. And as an anecdote, because I think this was really cool, I was at a brewery, this was years ago, that brewery happened to be ESOP owned. And just, I was looking through my pocket to tip the bartender and the bartender just said, oh, don't worry about a tip. We're an ESOP, just buy more beer. That's my tip. She had no idea that I even knew what an ESOP was, let alone that that was part of my career. But it was very cool because she saw as the bartender, the more beer we sold, the higher the stock price, the more money in my pocket. And that all leads to ESOP owned companies being more profitable and being more efficient. Right, and um, aligning behaviors and interests. No, that's fantastic. Okay. okay. Thank you for that, Leah. That was a good that was a good summary. I know it's a complicated topic and we're kind of scratching the surface, but um, okay. So the last pillar of these transitions, full sale of the business. And so right. when does a full sale become the most viable and beneficial exit strategy for owners? Well, full sale not only is probably you have the widest number of potential buyers between a financial buyer or a strategic buyer. But it also often allows you the ability to maybe get the most cash at close, maybe maximize value. Um, a lot of times it's important where if you don't have that management team that can continue to run the day-to-day -day business, by selling to an outside buyer, to a third party, they can bring in their own management team. Or they can bring in their own expertise that maybe your business was lacking. Um, and so there's really a partnership there. Uh, a lot of business owners end up selling conversely to an ESOP, for example, because they don't want things to change. They care about their business and their strategy. And that's true. If you sell to a third party, things will change. There's a new owner, but sometimes that change is good, right? It kind of forces the company to grow up. It allows you to have more access to capital. And it also allows you potentially to have better vendor relationships, supplier relationships, because you have this whole economies of scale. That's the hope. Um, I think whenever you're selling to a third party, business owners should recognize that it's a mutual relationship. So while they're getting to do diligence on your business, you also should be doing diligence on them as the buyer and making sure that whatever expectations are going forward, that you're aligned and what that is. Um, so it's it opens you up to a larger pool of potential investors, but there are changes anytime you sell to a third party, um, but that might be the right path for your company. Absolutely. Leah, so um, a brief wisdom bite, if you may. So if you had to, if you had to give, you know, wisdom as regards preparing for and executing a successful sell, what would your wisdom bite be for people who are entrepreneurs who are considering a full sale in terms of preparing for it? Preparing for it, like it's kind of like when you sell your house, you clean up your house and paint the walls and fix little things. It's the same thing when you're selling your business. You want to make sure that first and foremost, you have clean financial statements. Yeah. Maybe that means doing a quality of earnings report. If you haven't had the best um, audits going in the past, you haven't had audit in the past, um, making sure that if there's any legal issues that are kind of underlying any lawsuits, any litigation, that you have a good story behind it because companies get sued all the time. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but you want to make sure that you can minimize any fears by the buyers and overarching, the goal is to minimize any uncertainty, meaning anything that may be a potential risk, you want to be able to explain it and either clean it up or explain it because buyers don't like uncertainty because then that could end up being nothing or could end up being a very, very, very costly mistake or issue. So that's why I say financials, 
minimize any, any uncertainty with the financial statements, legal issues, employment issues, as much uncertainty as you can eliminate, the better. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's talk about maybe scenarios in between, because we had the four pillars just now, and they were very discreet. Let's talk about, are there any hybrid or blended strategies that combine elements of the different ownership transition options? And what benefits do these offer owners and the business? Absolutely. And I think one of the easiest examples would be, let's say a private equity firm came in and purchased 70% of the company, and then your family or management bought the remaining 30%, or you continue to hold the remaining 30%. There's a possibility of that mix of an outside buyer, a third party, plus management family, and somebody what I'll call internal buyer. And there, the benefits of that is that now you have a partner from a capitals perspective, from an expertise perspective, they can maybe help you with some of your financial statement analysis. They can maybe, um, they may have other portfolio companies that you can create some, some good relationships with and synergies. And it's still very much so a part of your culture and your business, right? Like if you are still owning even a minority portion, it, you still have some equity upside, first of all, like, and you still have some some say in where the overall business goes, especially culturally. Um, it's also very common, we'll see maybe a minority ESOP and a private equity firm, That's that could be a possibility. Same benefits from a retirement plan for your employees on the ESOP side, but also that partner and that access to capital on the, on the outside third-party buyer. So it is a possibility, I think, the challenge would be, especially when you're talking to third-party buyers, if you if they aren't buying 100%, your pool of buyers gets smaller. That's yeah. not to say that they're not out there. It just becomes smaller and smaller. And so the more niche you want your pro forma capital structure to be, your pro forma ownership, meaning post-transaction ownership, the smaller the pool of potential investors are. If you are a little more open, then there's going to be more potential buyers out there. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. So Leah, we've been kind of honed in on the structural part of these pillars. Let's talk about the practical aspects of on, on the business itself, right? Talking about business growth um, and, uh, you know, the convergence with owner exit strategy. So how can entrepreneurs balance their desire for liquidity and exit with the imperative to continue to grow and scale their business? Yeah, so it, it comes back to what are their what's their timeline? Um, if it's and what are their priorities? If their number one priority is growth and scaling the business, then it probably makes sense to find a potential buyer that has capital and the expertise and the desire to grow your business. Um, and maybe that's a merger, maybe that's a partnership with another firm that there's a lot of synergies potentially there. Um, but on the flip side, if your number one desire is growth and getting that capital, um, you probably also want to make sure that you're able to enjoy some of that growth and some of that potential upside. So also finding that, that happy medium where you continue to own direct equity or have some kind of equity upside in the business because as you grow, obviously the stock price will go higher. But more often than not, if growth is your number one priority, you're probably looking at some external investor or capital provider of some sort in order to help you to achieve those goals. Got it. Okay. All right. And you touched on it earlier, um, Leah, about you know the steps the owner should take. So go a little bit further now. What steps should an owner take to prepare their business for a successful exit, regardless of the transition strategy? Sure. I mean, number one, it's working with tax advisors and legal advisors on their estate and tax planning. And that I would recommend doing years in advance of actually selling your business, because the more time you have, the more flexibility you have on your structure. Um, so making sure that your state is in order the way that you want it to be, whatever that may be. Number two, making sure that you have that 
next level of leadership. Um, so if you're a business owner and all the contracts, all the relationships, all the customer relationships are with you, that's probably problematic for whoever the next owner is, because what happens when you leave, right? And even if you're not planning on leaving for years, what happens when something unforeseen happens if you get hit by a bus, right? Like, so you want to make sure that there's that next line that's there that can easily take over when, as you can start to step away from the business. So those are the two key factors is making sure that you have your estate and tax plan in really good shape and that you have that next level of management and leadership to run the business, even if you're not there. Understood. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. So what mistakes do owners make when choosing the um, the exit strategy? I think there's there's two sides and they're complete opposite. So one is moving too fast and just making a decision without knowing all the facts and circumstances. For the vast majority of business owners, you sell your business once and that's it, right? Like most people don't have more than one business. So gather data, educate yourself, Recognize that if, especially if you're selling to a third party, that it is a mutual relationship there. So make sure you're comfortable with whoever you're selling to um, and hire the right advisors. This is not the time to find the cheapest advisor. I'm not saying you have to go to the most expensive advisor, but you get what you paid for. So make sure that you have advisors that are truly educated on whatever path you take, but educate yourself, take time. It usually takes a while from when you start to think about transitioning ownership to when you're actually doing it. So even if you're five to 10 years out from selling, you should probably start educating yourself today on all the different options. Conversely, I have seen business owners that go too slow. Yeah, I get it. It's a very emotional decision selling your business. It's, it's difficult. And this is a lot of times their baby. They've grown this business from the ground up. And they don't want to make a decision as to what the next owner will be. But I've talked to a lot of 85, 90 year olds that are still the sole shareholder of their business. And we're all mortal. And we have, if they don't make the decision, their estate will. And it may be a decision that you don't like. So I have seen lots of family feuds. I have seen lots of really messy estates because the business owner moved too slow and just refused to put his estate in order and make that decision. So it's be educated, make an educated guess, but also recognize that you need, if you don't make a decision, your estate will, and you have no control over it at that point. So. Understood. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And so Le Leah, you know, let's role play a little bit. I I'm an owner and I'm really thinking of these various pillars. I want to kind of have some type of event. What are the questions I should be asking myself? A lot of your questions should be around where do I want, where do I want my business to go? What are our opportunities? What are some of our threats? What should I be, how, how involved do I want it to be in the business? And then what is my timeline? What are my needs for capital, for liquidity? Like if you are not looking for any money, right? Like things are fine. You don't really need that excess capital. That probably changes your timeline and it also probably changes what decision you ultimately take. If you really need a couple million dollars for some other big investment or, or a new house or what have you, but you don't want to leave the business, that probably to me would mean just take a dividend, right? Like in, and take some money off the table and move on. Um, so it's really, what is your timeline? What are your goals personally and for your company? And what are your goals also for your family too? Like some business owners, they have no family that's going to get involved in the business and that's fine, but that's a very different decision process than if they have family that is active and wants to take over the business. So it's really um, being honest with yourself on what your timeline is, what your goals are, and what your company's goals are. Got it. So, uh, so Leah, for the owners who have been wildly successful in a transition type of event, what, what would you say, you know, 
um, you know, resulted in that? What would you say? What would be the advice for the ones that have been wildly successful that they did that you would basically advise the audience? The companies that have been successful were very comfortable with their buyer, right? Like they liked either whether it was an ESOP, whether it was family or um, a third party, they were confident with the buyer and the there was agreement before closing on what was going to happen going forward, at least at a high level, right? Like there was agreement that operations would stay headquartered in Florida, for example, versus moving to wherever they're headquartered. Like things like that were known, agreed to. Um, culturally, it was a good fit um, as far as expectations of the employees, expectations of um, the current shareholder and the future shareholders. And that from a estate and tax planning perspective, they had a plan before they even closed the transaction. So it's really open communication, having a plan, having clear expectations of all parties involved. Those are the ones that are the most successful. Okay. Now I would imagine if I if I went the 180 degrees and let's do the colliery question, the ones that have failed abysmally, what do you think they did wrong and they should have done differently? The number one reason why um transactions fail is disagreement on value. So business owners think that they're worth the moon and buyers, obviously, they're trying to get the best deal that they can and they don't think that. And where that's where knowing value and being realistic about the value of your business before you sell or really pursue this is very important. Um, and then the other thing that I've seen, and this is where um, potential third party buyers get a bad reputation, is that they come and they say, oh, we'll pay you this much money. And then at the 11th hour, they drop it. Right. So having an understanding of how they, how did they come up with that valuation, at least at a high level, they're not going to share all their their math with you and knowing getting a very strong feeling of what are the odds of them at the 11th hour dropping the price? Because that's when most transactions fall through is there's these last minute changes or restrictions. And that reminds me another opportunity for sellers of businesses, especially if you're selling to a third party, ask to speak to other business owners who have sold to that firm and, yeah. and understand what their process was. And then if there are any red flags, you can know it early in the process versus at the very last minute. So that's another thing. When I say they're doing diligence on you, you can also be doing diligence on them and making sure you understand what that relationship is between the buyer and the seller. Okay. All right. What question should I have asked you that I didn't, Leah? I think, you know, it's really tough because every one of these decisions is very specific to that company and to that individual selling shareholder. Um, and it can get very nitty gritty detailed. So I, I really liked your questions. First of all, Richard, I think you asked, you got a good scope. Um, but I think the key message would be learn more, talk to your advisors, um, but whether that's your accountants, your lawyers early on and kind of figure out where your company is and where you want it to go um, and then find the right solution from there. But there's a lot of flexibility when you're thinking about selling your business, but there's also, there can be potentially a lot of complexity because of that. So get a good team of advisors early on that you feel confident with so that you make the right decision. Perfect. Okay. And I think you've kind of gone into the last point here, which is what is your parting advice, Leah, for founders looking to exit um, for growth, liquidity, and control? What, 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 was, what would be your parting advice there? You know, number one is, is figure out what your end game is, both personally yep. and for your company. Where do you want it to go? And then back into how you're going to get there. Perfect. I know a lot of entrepreneurs that want to go in 50 different directions and that's fabulous. And all 50 directions may be feasible, but you got to pick one. 
and just really narrow it down to where you want your end goal to be. And then you can be much more successful in whatever path you choose. Absolutely. Like everything else, the privilege of focus and prioritizing. Un wonderful. Leah, thank you so much. This was highly informative. I learned a lot. This is brilliant. Thank you very much. This is thank you. Well thank done. you very much for having me. And um, this has been a pleasure. No, absolutely. It. Thank you very much, Leah. All the very best. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.